Slightly behind schedule, we come to our last speaker, Professor Mark Ferguson, who I'm sure will address the balance for those of us who come from a scientific end. So Mark Ferguson is the Director General of Science Foundation Ireland and Chief Advisor, Chief Scientific Advisor to our government. He's the co-founder, CEO and Chairman of the Renovo Group, a Professor of Life Science at the University of Manchester since 1984, the author of hundreds of research papers, book chapters and books, 60 patents, and also the, re the recipient of the CBE for Service to Health and Life Sciences, Professor Ferguson. Very good. So thank you very much. While you're putting up the slides, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to come to speak. It's wonderful. Um, thank you also for putting me on last because I shall try and draw on something uh, from each of the fellow contributors. And, um, and also this morning we have seen the play out of classical stereotypes, whether from the arts uh, or elsewhere. And I hope not to disappoint uh, because um, I am a scientist. I will have no notes. I will only have slides, and I will try and talk from data. So can I have the uh, first slide, please? Uh, very good. So um, if we can move uh, on from that one. This is a very interesting graph. This graph plots on the vertical axis the frequency of a scientific discovery, and on the horizontal axis the magnitude of that scientific discovery. And that graph is a heavy tailed distribution. You can plot that graph anywhere in the world, from America, from Europe, from Ireland, from the UK, doesn't matter, you'll get the same pattern. So what does that graph tell you? It tells you in the area labeled A, most scientific discoveries are small and incremental. So most discoveries in science add in some way to the total body of knowledge, but they are not themselves massive discoveries. They may be quite useful discoveries, nor are they particularly proprietary discoveries. They're things that if you hadn't made them today, probably one of your colleagues somewhere in the world would have made the same discovery tomorrow. And that's the vast bulk of what scientific discovery is about. But the more interesting piece is labeled B, and that's on the tail, and that tells you that really important scientific discoveries are quite rare. The probability of making a major scientific discovery, for example, the new use for an old drug, is quite small. But the fact that it's a heavy-tailed distribution means that the probability of making a major scientific discovery, such as the one that I've just described, the new use for an old drug, is about the same as the probability of making a truly groundbreaking, earth-shattering, whatever adjectives you want to use, scientific discovery like invention of the internet. Those two probabilities are about the same, and they are both smaller by a long order of magnitude than the probability of making a normal a quote, uh, or incremental scientific discovery. So this graph, I think, tells you quite a lot about the creative process, and it tells you quite a lot about how you should think about science funding and how you should think about technology transfer. So for example, in B, to pick up Carol's point, for me, the most difficult thing to get anybody to do in science is to think. You can re-describe that graph as A, cranking the handle, okay? I'm just gonna look at another little bit of knowledge. In B is where people think. So when I used to run a very active scientific laboratory, I made it mandatory for all people who worked with me to do boring tasks, because that's when you think. Washing glassware is terrific, okay? <laughs> you can, it's a routine thing, you can kind of do it, and if you're all hyped up with your scientific ideas, you can think about what you're doing, and if you drop the occasional piece of glassware, no big deal. Somebody like me will fund it at the end of the day. Um, so, so this is where you think it's the most difficult thing to get people to do. The easiest thing to get people to do is A, which is cranking the handle. Write another grant application, learning in ever more detail the details of something without actually stepping back. Second thing that's really interesting is from a science funder point of view or from a government's point of view, we'd really like more of B. So the question is, how do you get that? Well, one way you can get it is to put more money into the system. This is usually what people say, if we just did a lot more of it, 
then by probability you would get B. And that's the US approach, stack more money into the system. There is really no good evidence that that works. There are probably quite good correlative evidence given that our expansion of knowledge correlates with spending more money on the science base, but as a level of evidence, it's quite low. Are there any higher levels of evidence of how you can get B? And the answer is yes. A crisis or a big national problem or a big national challenge. So if you have a war, B goes up. People become very creative. They solve problems that are really important and they make new discoveries. Now, I am not advocating that we go to war, please do not think that, but it is absolutely correct when you analyze the data. And what that tells you is focused need drives creativity. So the idea that all creativity comes from sitting under a tree, smoking dope, and dreaming wonderful thoughts may be true, may be true, but there's another side of it which is really driven by need and the need is the ability to solve a very challenging problem very quickly. You see that in war, you see it in the space race in the United States where huge things happened, where there was a national, international challenge to put a man on the moon, you know, before uh, the end of the century. So those things galvanize creativity and they actually increase the amount of B compared to A. That's quite interesting. We have a serious challenge and in Ireland, we are not going to waste a good crisis. In the crisis, we want more of B. Okay, so there is a crisis, and there's an opportunity to galvanize people in order to solve or be more creative about the problems. Now, you can be very cynical about this, and you can say that the grand challenges, as elaborated by research funders such as the EU or ourselves or whatnot, have not engaged science in the same way that the space race has. That's maybe true, and that's a challenge for social sciences to help science. But what is equally true is if you look at some of the modern areas of science, for example, development of telephone apps. Telephone apps are an invention of the last 10 years of a mobile phone. There are approximately 800 downloads of an application from a mobile phone per second. And it's growing exponentially. Huge, huge, huge area of creativity. Who's creating these apps? Children. There's lots of kids. Many of them on the west coast of Ireland and around Galway where we are. These are people making creative apps on the phone. Some of them have sold their businesses for six-figure sums. You ask these children, why are they making the apps? It's not to make money. That's not the first answer you get. The first answer you get is, I want more people playing my game than my friend over here. This is a different form of playing marbles or conquerors, but it's a much more creative form. These people are developing programs, they're developing games, they're thinking about how they can engage people, how they can get people uh, to play their game and not their friend's game. They're actually probably only one to two months ahead of the players. Because when you develop a game or something for an app, you haven't got the whole thing done, right? You've only got a bit of it, and you've got people playing, and then you kind of got to make it up. It's a bit like a story or a painting. You've got to uh, be making it up kind of as you go along and be about a month or two ahead of the market. Same thing in science. In science, we don't know what we're going to discover uh, going forward. So on the one hand, you can be cynical, but on the other hand, you can be extraordinarily positive. Isn't it remarkable that there are school children who have the talents and the creativity to do B and to develop that into something that's economically important and that those applications give enjoyment to people and that they provide benefits such as health or environment or what have you. So I think it's a very interesting and dynamic uh, situation. It's something that one wants to think about a lot. In terms of technology transfer and universities, A is the domain of licensing, it's the domain of people transfer, it's the domain of industrial collaboration. The vast bulk of what we do needs to be done in a research ecosystem with very good collaboration and very good porosity between industry and academia. B is where you will create truly disruptive new industries of value, and that's about new company formation and protection of intellectual property 
and uh, developing that for indigenous industries. So if you review the profile of any tech transfer office in any university, you ought to see a lot more licenses, a lot more research collaborations, a lot more collaborative grants than successful spin-out companies. I put it to you, when you do that analysis, it's not always what you find. And that's really quite interesting because you need to understand that most things in science are best developed in a collaborative sense because they're small incremental discoveries. That doesn't mean they're not valuable. An incremental discovery that increases the cost effectiveness of how you're manufacturing something is really economically very valuable. So enough on this graph, but it is something you should think about. If you translate this into science funding, what does it mean? It means you absolutely want scientific excellence, and whilst excellence is absolutely required, it's not sufficient. You need both excellence and impact, or potential impact. If you're a science funder, one of the ways you make your investments, if you're sensible, is in a diverse portfolio of uncorrelated risk. What does that mean? You invest some of your funds in really excellent people. You fund some of your funds in needs-based research. You fund some of your funds in societal challenges, as the European Commissioner commented earlier, some of it in infrastructure and so on. It doesn't have to be an equal balance, and the balance can change with time, depending on societal um, uh, challenges. You need an intelligent mix between scientists choosing what to research and being told where they should be looking. Of course there's academic freedom, and of course people should be free, but most people don't actually exercise intellectual and uh, academic freedom. They're working on something that they worked at when they were a student, which is something that their supervisor worked at. It's not some profound thing. It's a kind of historical thing. And another way of interpreting that, or stating it, is that some people will research on a topic because they see the light, and other people will research a topic because they feel the heat. And as a science funding agency, we will use all elements at our disposal, which include both heat and light. Next point up there is really important. The folly of rewarding A whilst hoping for B. So when you set metrics, or when you decide how you're going to assess something, if you set those metrics, what you measure will be what you get. Scientists are people. They will respond in the system, and they will give you what you want. So if you say, I want a number of publications, that's what you're going to get. If you say, I want very high quality publications in these journals, that's what you'll get. But if those are your metrics, and what you're hoping for is licenses and economic development and spin-out companies, that's not what you're going to get. So you should be very clear in the objectives for any science funding program what it is you want to achieve and set the appropriate metrics and make sure that they're different in the different parts of your diverse portfolio. For very creative people, it might be one thing. For an industrially focused program, it might be something quite different. And no university and no science funding agency should get railroaded into a very narrow set of metrics. Not all excellence is measured by publications in Nature and Science. There are other measures of excellence. That is just one. And it's really important, and it's really important for universities in promotion criteria. What professor in a university in Ireland got promoted because he or she promoted local innovation in the companies around the university? You can say it's important. Show me the people who've been promoted on that criteria dominantly. I put it to you, you won't find many. So what you measure is what you get. As I said before, you need the support for outstanding peoples, and themes is a way of playing the system. You can take people into different areas by developing research themes. It's an intelligent way of drawing the community to solve really important problems. I often say that when you're a science funding agency and you're dealing with extremely intelligent academics, it is very, very difficult to herd cats, but I can certainly change the position of their feeding bowls. And that's sort of what, <laughs> and that's sort of what the themes uh, piece of this is. Smart specialization, the commissioner mentioned this a little bit earlier. One thing uh, from an Ireland perspective that's very important, small countries are not scaled down versions of large countries. Ireland is not a small version of the United States. It is not a small version of the United Kingdom or of Germany or any place else. Small countries are different. 
okay? And what that means in terms of science funding is you cannot do everything well. Even if we had an infinite amount of money, there are only four and a half million people in Ireland, there are seven universities, 19 institutes of technology, you can't do everything well. So you've got to think about what you want to do, and you absolutely cannot win unless you choose to compete. And choosing to compete means that you're sensible about where you allocate the majority of your resources. So this is about selecting sectors, it's about prioritizing funding, but it's also about aligning all of the actors behind those choices. This is not a single choice that's driven out of one particular sector. This is a choice that involves the science funding agency, it involves the universities, it involves the industrial base, it involves the government, it involves society. These are challenges that relate across the board, but in a small country, I believe you have to make some choices. And that's behind the EU's uh, philosophy of smart specialization, which we strongly support. In Ireland, the way that's been implemented on the left is the research prioritization exercise. In the middle is the government's action plan for jobs, a series of prioritized uh, actions spanning all bases of government, including science, uh, for jobs. And on the right, a completely new intellectual property framework and set of laws about how you translate things from research into commercialization. And that national research prioritization exercise is very logically based. It asks four simple questions. If you're looking for areas to prioritize funding in Ireland, the areas associated with a large global market or markets or enterprises in which Ireland already competes or can realistically compete, publicly performed R&D is required to exploit that and will complement the private sector. We have built or are building objectively measured strengths in those areas and the priority area represents an approach to a national or global uh, challenge to which Ireland should respond. These are sensible questions to ask. The results are shown here, I'm not going to go through, it's not appropriate for this talk. 14 areas, a series of underpinning things. And the Science Agency, Science Foundation Ireland, which I have the privilege to lead, also has a strategic plan. And that strategic plan has four simple but important strategic objectives. One, to be the best, the best science funding agency in the world at creating impact from excellent science. So we cannot be the best science funding agency in the world, we're not big enough, but we can be the best at creating impact from excellent science, and that's what we aim to do. Second is to be an exemplar in building partnerships with the EU, with other countries, the US, with industry, with charities, with philanthropy, and so on. Third is to have a very engaged and scientifically informed public. I want the Irish public to be comfortable both as users and producers of scientific knowledge and technology. That's important for a modern society. It doesn't mean they have to be expert, it doesn't even mean they have to appreciate it or like it, but they have to be informed. They have to be engaged in the debate. And then lastly, is to be a very efficient uh, modern public service staffed in a lean and mean fashion. For those of you who don't know, we spend less than 5% of our budget on total administration, which puts us in the top centile in the world, and that's where we intend to be. So the structure of um, our Agenda 2020 is very simple. It's like a business plan. What are your goals? Why is the objective important? What actions are we going to take? And how are we going to know when we've got there? Let me give you an example. We want to massively increase the number of trained researchers going into industry. Why? Because people with a high level of training are required for innovation, driving high value products, exports, and so on. How are we going to do this? An industrial fellowship scheme where we will fund people from the academic base to spend at least one year in industry and we will pick up the salary to work on a joint research project. And how will we know when we have achieved it? By 2020, 50% of the people we fund will have moved into an industry. It's a very simple set of metrics that allow you to see where you are. In terms of smart specialization, some of Ireland's unique selling points are geography. This is the, one of the best locations in the west of Ireland together with the west coast of Scotland for marine renewable energy. It's where the accumulated energy of the Atlantic crashes on shore in the waves. We ought to be in that, and we are. Size and technological sophistication. Ireland is a very technologically sophisticated country. It's small, so you can use it as a test bed, for example, in the grid. Industry, huge investments from multinationals and ICT, pharmaceuticals, medical devices, games, and so on. And obviously the mix of academic excellence uh, that's in the science base. 
This is the expenditure. It's stabilised at around about 160 million a year. This is the global expenditure of the Irish government, the so-called Gabord, which is an OECD statistic. You'll see that despite the downturn in Ireland's uh, economic uh, uh, performance, you will see the investment in science has been maintained. And that's a very strong commitment from the government that science and innovation are important. Now, here's an interesting figure. This is the breakdown of all of the funding that goes into research in Ireland. And the biggest piece labeled HEA block at about 28% uh, is money that goes directly to the universities for research. So to your point, this is the university's money. This is not competitively won. And it's the biggest chunk of the budget. So you should ask yourself some questions. How are you using that money? Are you using it for heating and lighting electricity? Are you using it for teaching? Or are you doing some fundamental research with it? Very interesting question. The two little bits below that are from the Department of Education, competitively won research, the Irish Research Council. The next block in purple is Science Foundation Ireland. The next two blocks labeled EI and IDA are funds that go predominantly into industry, but some of it also goes into academia. And then small pieces into agriculture, health, environment, and so on. So it is interesting from a government perspective when you look at this pie, Actually, the biggest slice of it is not competitively won. So you should ask yourself some questions. What are you doing with that money? And that takes me to your part of the, uh, of the talk. What do we do for 150 million? About 3,000 people in Ireland, 28 clusters of excellence, over 5,000 papers, about 80 patent filings, 40 companies. The bottom figure is really important. We leverage more money than we spend. And that's a really key hallmark of what SFI is about. It's about using the Irish state's money, hard-won Irish taxpayers' money, is being invested catalytically to bring other people and other funders into the system and to leverage that money. And it's our aim to increase that from where we currently are, which is one-to-one -one leverage. We spend about 150 million. We leverage about 150 million, actually to about two-to-one. I think we can leverage twice as much money as we spend. Part of that's preparing people for Horizon 2020. Part of it is industry. Part of it is from the United States. It's a lot of stuff. OK, very quickly, and I'm going to finish on this. Uh, so this is just to make you feel good about Ireland. How have we done? Um, Ireland is rated in the top 20 in all scientific fields. Science Foundation Ireland is about 12 years old. The uh, president paid tribute to Professor Pat Fottrell, who's in the audience. He was one of the founders of Science uh, Foundation Ireland. And uh, 12 years ago, Ireland was ranked about number 40, below Bangladesh, in terms of international citation rankings. And through a steady and progressive investment, has climbed the ranks to be in the top 20 in all fields. Number one in molecular genetics and genomics. Number two in probiotics, which has got microbe interactions. Number three in immunology. Number six in nanotechnology. Eight in material science. Ten in computer science. So by all kinds of academic criteria, pretty good. Now I look at innovation. This is the NCAD report that looks at 143 company, countries for innovation. Ireland is ranked ninth in the world for innovation. Ninth out of 143 companies, and it's ahead of the United States. So this is done based per capita. On a per capita basis, Ireland is more innovative than the US. Isn't that a fantastic figure? And if you look at the scores, and these are out of 143, we're number four in terms of institutions, seven for human capital, access to credits. You can read it as well as I can read it that's up there. What's interesting is if you look at the field of innovation, which has to do with assimilating and disseminating knowledge, the very uh, focus of this conference, we are the only country in the world that has a top 10 ranking in all indicators. The only country in the world with a top 10 ranking in all of those indicators. And I've pulled out some of them. Knowledge absorption, number two in the world. Royalty and license fee payments per capita of GDP, number one. Remember the graph I showed you, the heavy tail distribution? Something there is working, OK? That's good. Uh, computer and communicative service input, uh, imports. So we import more comp computation software than any other country. And we export more of it. This tells you this sector is very dynamic. Huge imports, huge exports, and knowledge diffusion, number two. So this is a pretty good uh, plot. This is a graph you can't uh, see, I'm sure, 
That's why I'll be true to stereotype and being a scientist. And this is the plot of all 143 countries. Where that big arrow is is Ireland, number nine. Above it is Sweden, Singapore, um, uh, uh, and a few other countries, UK. Below it in the big white bubble is the United States. And that's all in the group of innovation leaders in the uh, left-hand side in that ellipse with the two big bubbles. The two big bubbles are India and China, fast coming to the top, and the rest of the countries uh, that are located there. This is an INSEAD report, completely independent, nothing to do with any government or anything. It's from the INSEAD Business School, a very detailed report. Here are the industry sectors in Ireland, nine of the top 10 global pharmaceuticals, 15 of the top 20 medical technology companies, many of them around here in Galway, nine of the top 10 US ICT companies, nine of the top 10 software companies, and you can read it for yourself. This is a huge resource for the academic base. We have to have and do have programs that link this industrial base into uh, the academic uh, uh, environment. Here's one of them, a centers program that we've just completed Major proposals solicited in any one of the research categories. Mandatory, there's 30% funding from industry. Mandatory that at least 10% of that is in cash and in a flexible hub and spoke model. So we announced this about a couple of months ago. The largest ever investment in the history of the state of Ireland was made about two months ago in research. This is at a time when we're still a Troika company, country with a bailout country, uh, uh, program. This is phenomenal. People are still engaged at the highest political level for investment in science and innovation uh, because it's important. It's the future of the country. 200 million from SFI, 100 million co-investment from industry, 150 companies. The largest ever public-private partnership, something you referred to earlier in your talk, um, uh, between the state and companies in world-class science across the higher education institutes uh, in Ireland, and it supports key actions that are in the plans and addresses major societal challenges that I won't go into. Um, seven of these funded, what are they? Food for health, probiotics, which is where I told you we had a lot of stuff, perinatal health, diagnosing disease in infants and in uh, pregnant mums with a huge interaction with the diagnostic industry, pharmaceutical production, synthesis and so on, really important area for Ireland, material science, big data, Look at that, 75 million investment to data analytics, all the big data that's coming out, where Ireland has really key strengths, some of them here at the University of Galway, in Derry, but others in UCD and so on, all now linked together in a single centre. Huge photonics and marine renewable energy, which I spoke about. So these are flexible funding mechanisms, they're private-public partnerships. Let me close by saying we live in a time of unprecedented opportunity an unprecedented change. Very fast pace of discovery, huge discoveries being made all the time. For the first time ever in human history, the applicability of those discoveries is limited as much by our ability to apply them as it is to discover the stuff in the first instance. So it is equally creative to apply the existing knowledge as it is to discover new knowledge. Both of those things are valuable. Both of those things are important. There are huge quantities of data. Every second pouring out of smart cities, smart grids, universities, whatever. Data analytics, evidence-based uh, policy making even would be wonderful. Significant political and societal changes. A big portion of the world have given up on communism. They've decided to enter, enter capitalism. Billions of capitalists have entered the system in China, in Russia, and elsewhere, and they want to win. And we want to compete and win. And remember, in business, in academia, in creativity, market share is won and lost at times of change. We are in a time of change. I personally am extremely optimistic. Ireland will not waste a good crisis. We will try and get more of B on the graph that I spoke about at length to begin with. And I think you should reflect on some of those data and hopefully they reflect on some of the talks from the previous speakers. And thank you very much for the invitation to speak.